Good afternoon, everyone. We will begin in two minutes, so please stand by. Good afternoon. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you, Dr. Zong. Yes, uh, so I, sh I shall start now? My no, 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 not yet. Oh, okay, not yet, okay. Good afternoon to all of you. Okay, good afternoon to our audience online, specifically who are watching with us via YouTube. So I would like to welcome you on the third day or the third Friday. This is actually the third Friday of this year's Food Thinkers Congress. So I am Magdalena Kaba, your moderator for today. So this event, the third Philippine Koreanist Congress, is organized by the University of the Philippines, Korea Research Center, or UPKRC. UPKRC was launched on April 27, 2016, aiming to provide Filipino scholars and researchers with opportunities to widen their interest in Korean studies. UPKRC holds various academic and cultural activities for Filipino scholars and professionals and serves as a university-wide hub that will help promote and develop Korean studies in the country. So for more information and updates, please visit uh, facebook.com slash UPKRC. Okay, so for everyone's information, this year's Philippine Koreanist Congress has an overarching theme entitled Revisiting Diversity and Multiculturalism in Contemporary Korea transborder relations and policy implications. So we are featuring seven research papers that are related with current affairs in Korean Peninsula, South Korea, North Korea reunification dialogue, portrayals of North Korea in South Korea, and Philippine media to name a few. So for the past two Fridays, we already had our lectures, but you can rewatch that lecture via UPKRC YouTube channel. Okay, so I think for today's session, we have two distinguished uh, speakers. So our YouTube audience, while you, our speakers are presenting, please feel free to post your questions in our YouTube chat box, like the past two Fridays, and our speakers will address them at the end of their lectures. So while you do that, please do not forget to use our official hashtags, okay? Hashtag UPKRC and hashtag 3PKC. So now without further delay, let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker has a PhD from the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. His research interests are political parties and elections. So everyone, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ku Jong. Dr. Jong, whenever you're ready. Hello. Um, I'm, today, I'm going to talk about, a, uh, about the North and South Korea relations, uh, particularly in relations to how can the South Korea assimilate better towards the North Korean defectors. Because, um, unfortunately, South Korea still has a major problem in dealing with the foreigners, uh, especially refugees and the migrants. But also, you know, but uh, 
they have a discrimination against other minorities, but particularly with uh, with uh, refugees and uh, migrants. Okay. So studies conducted by the uh, Minister of Women's Affairs and the Family Ministry of Women's and the Family Affairs uh, in South Korea in 2017, uh, one in four North Korean defectors who come to South Korea experience either threats or deportation and physical violence. And also they report that they receive a sexual violation and also a number of them have income, uh, become a fake spies. So North Korean defectors have told lawmakers, media and academic researchers that they were subjected to threat of deportation as well as uh, sexual abuse and uh, physical violence during their uh, protective custody period, which I will explain it uh, in a minute. Also, um, the studies by the Ministry of uh, Women's Affairs and the Family uh, Survey shows that the several uh, women uh, defectors from North Korea that said that they have been raped and sexually assaulted by the Korean intelligence and police officers who are actually in fact tasked to protect them. So this is a serious case. And lastly, a um, number of them actually, I will give out two cases of them, but a number of them during their, uh, uh, under the such called a protective custody have become a, um, fake spies, uh, so which means that the National Intelligence Services as well as the Prosecution's Office make a Trump, uh, trumped up charges against them and make them a fake spy. Uh, one case actually kept captured the, the minds of the Koreans in August 2013. So uh, Mr. Yoo Woo-sung uh, was cleared on charges of spying for the North Korean regime. And the charges were based on a testimony of Mr. Yu, Yu's sister, who was also in, indicted by the prosecution's office and was held under uh, custody by the National Security Agency, National Intelligence Services, uh, said that her brother was a spy. But later on during the court session, she actually uh, test, testified that she did so under a stress and uh, she was beaten up uh, by the interrogators and were per, uh, hold in a solitary confinement for 179 days. And also the other case that I want to bring is Mr. Hong Gang Chol, which actually is a normal person but by the prosecution's office, he was turned into a this elite spy from the Supreme Command, Supreme Guard Command of the North Korea, who were sent to kidnap a broker who was helping the North Koreans to escape to South. But uh, long story short, all these char trumped up charges found not guilty by the court. And uh, the NIS, uh, both NIS and the, which is a short for uh, National Intelligence Services, as well as the prosecution's office were under a uh, very intense, um, let's say, uh, heat. So why are they being treated like this? So we have to know a uh, one institution, which they actually go through all the defectors when they come to South are sent to a facility called the North Korean Refugee Center. Uh, it's more widely known as the Joint Interrogation Center. Uh, and these people, the, the defectors, they go undergo a screening process to see if they qualify under a Article 9 of the protection of defecting North Korean residents and support of their settlement act. So here in the joint uh, interrogation center, the defectors stay from one to six months to be determined non-suspicious. And only then they're moved to Hanawon, a place called Hanawon and in a settlement resettlement aid center in Ansong, where they can stay for three to 12 months before their status as a Korean citizen is finally granted and are given the passport. 
So the problem of this, I see my research, uh, during my research, uh, found that the, the National Intelligence Services, uh, which operate the Joint Interrogation Center, has no independent monitoring uh, control and control. So for example, the refugees without any relatives in South Korea, they have no way of knowing where they are held at. So, and so it's been known that Defectors Protection Center, AKA the interrogation center has been known to uh, make a fake spies uh, cases to arrest and discredit dissidents and divert attention from the domestic political crisis. But my point and the central question of my argument is, my question is why are they actually under such a pressure and under such a uh, abuse? The reason why it's because the North Korean defectors under the protection of defecting North Korean residents and the support of their settlement act in 1997, which is written in 1997 and keeps revised until now. Uh, it's not specific on the types of protections that North Korean defectors are entitled to, which in the article four uh, doesn't really specify anything. Also, uh, the articles are not really specific on organization responsible for the North Korean defectors. Like, uh, so the decision-making body for considering the who to protect and uh, what kind of protection to give consists of Minister of National Unification and also National Security Planning and the NIS. So you can see the complexity of making a decision there. Lastly, and more importantly, uh, there's no clear defined legal status to North Korean defectors. And this exposes them to uh, legally sensitive matters as well as uh, abuse. Okay, so my, according, uh, during my research on this topic, I came across a number of um, existing international as well as uh, national law, which can actually, we can explore and uh, create a more debate about the legal status of uh, the Koreans. I mean, the North Koreans who cross over to South. So based on my research, uh, I can raise the two questions here. So are the North Korean defectors, are they an economic refugees or a political defector? And number two, are they Korean nationals? So according to the United Nations conventions on relating to the status of refuge which refuge, uh, refuge uh, which signed on July 28, 1951. Their definition of refuge is as someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-founded fear of being perse persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of the particular social group or a political opinion. Okay, so in light of this, definition, a North Korean defectors can be considered, I argue, as an international refuge, for they have a well-founded fear of being persecuted upon being forcefully returned to North Korea, where a repatriated person is either put to death as an anti-government element or sent to a political laboring camp, according to the Article 47 of North Korean criminal law. Exciting. Also, I found that according to the United Nations Convention, uh, United Nations um, High Commissioner on Refuge, they added uh, an interesting uh, a clause, a new category for the refugees. Refugees, the uh, it, it's called the internally displaced persons or the IDPs. So these consist of firstly who are forced to flee their homes because of their lives were at danger. Second, they remain exposed to violence and other human rights violation during their displacement. Uh, thirdly, they have uh, no or only very limited access to food, employment, education, and healthcare. And fourth and lastly, unlike refugees, but they did not cross international borders. So when you, Think about it. 
the North Korean defectors in South actually qualify for number uh, first, second, and third. But the fourth, it's a bit questionable because they did not cross the international borders. They crossed the national borders. Here's uh, what, it, what uh, this comes in interesting when we actually consider an, another existing law, which is the Constitution of a Republic of Korea. So according to the Constitution of uh, Republic of Korea, chapter one, article three says that the, con uh, the Constitution states that the territory of a Republic of Korea shall consist of the Korean Peninsula, which includes the North and its adjacent island. So when you go back to the IDP slide back again, and the fourth, that unlike refugees, they did not cross the international borders. Actually, when you consider the, uh, the constitution, they are actually, in fact, uh, qualify for the, the refugees. So based on this uh, descriptions and uh, discussion, number one, the North Korean defectors are consider, can be considered or are considered as a refugee based on the definitions of UNSRS and UNHCR IDP. Also, North Korean defectors should be considered as a Korean nationals based on the Constitution of Republic of Korea, but which obviously they are not when they arrive and sent to the, the interrogation center, uh, they have no legal status, even though we have a clear, um, clearly defined international as well as a national law to give them the, such a right. Without this legal status and the rights, that's, they, that's why uh, the North Koreans are, uh, they actually experience and undergo this um, human rights violations. So summary and my conclusion is that uh, with its growing international reputation, the Republic of Korea should assimilate refugee and minority groups. And it's time for us to seriously think and discuss on the legal status of the North, Korea, uh, North Korean defectors because South Korea and, and uh, South Korea, lastly, South Korea should consider North Korean defectors as a citizens uh, based on the following existing laws. Number one, the UNSRS, UNHCR, IDP, and the Constitution of Republic Korea. So that is end of my discussion today. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Jong, okay, for your present for your lecture. Okay, so I'm sure our YouTube audience has questions as well. So uh, before we entertain our questions, we will finish all the lectures, but just post your questions in our YouTube chat box. And of course, don't forget to use our hashtag. Okay, at this point, let us proceed to our next lecture, to our next speaker. Our next speaker is currently an assistant professor at Far Eastern University and is serving as the Associate Dean of the Institute of Arts and Sciences. He is teaching courses on East Asian government and politics, theories of international relations, international organizations, and globalization of world politics. So everyone, our next speaker is Professor Mark Salvador Isla. So, Professor Isla, whenever you're ready. Okay, can you see my PowerPoint slides? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, good afternoon. Before I start, please allow me to thank uh, the UPKRC for organizing the third Koreanist Congress and also for inviting me to join um, this program. So this afternoon, I'm going to talk about honoring commitment to refugee regimes, comparative study of the refugee policy of the Philippines and the Republic of Korea. 
So these are the key points that I'm going to talk about. So many countries are confronted by the concern on the increasing numbers of people fleeing the, from countries devastated by an ongoing intrastate war. At least um, 79.5 million people around the world have been forced to flee their homes. Among them are nearly 26 million refugees and around half of whom are under age of 18. According to the UNHCR, there are also millions of states, stateless people who have been denied a nationality and lack access to basic rights such as education, health, employment, and freedom of movement. This in turn put the pressure to various government to respond to accept refugees as part of their commitment um, to various international refugee regimes. Establishment of the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees or the 1951 Convention reflects awareness uh, of the inequality of effort required to protect refugees and the corresponding need for state solidarity. Some governments have received refugees uh, with some degree of generosity afforded to them with protection and whatever assistance possible. Um, in 2016, a new, back, uh, into a new international agreement to forge a stronger, fairer response to large refugee movements known as the Global Compact on Refugees endorsed by members of the UN General Assembly. And the compact builds upon not replaces the existing international legal system for refugees, which includes the 1951 Convention and other international legal instruments on refugee, human rights, and humanitarian law. In the Philippines, um, the Philippines is one of the few countries in Asia Pacific to have acceded to the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees and its 1967 protocol um, for the relating to the status of refugees. On the other hand, um, Republic of Korea acceded uh, to the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees and to its 1967 protocol in December 1992. The, also, the, country is also, the country also acceded to the 1954 Convention relating to the status of stateless person. Against this backdrop, um, the question that this research want, uh, wants to or ho hopes to answer is how do the government of the Philippines and Republic of Korea um, compare in terms of outcomes or policy outcomes for accepting refugees? And what are the factors that influence the policy response of the two governments? So the objective is to examine policy responses as regards to refugee acceptance and protection and analyze the factors that greatly influence policy responses of the two countries. And lastly, to identify policy gaps and alternatives for further development of refugee policies of two countries. Um, just to um have a caveat of this research related to this research um this research will focus on policies related to refugees and asylum seekers and for the purpose of discussion the term refugee will follow the definition stated in the 1951 convention related to the status of refugees in the context of korea the term refugee refers to people from countries outside of the korean peninsula North Korean um, defectors are not considered refugees, as I think as also mentioned by our previous speaker. So in the context of the Philippines, the internationally displaced individuals are different from refugees. Um, let's look at the refugee experiences of the two countries. So the first, um, 
let's look at the re- the nine waves of refugee experiences um, of the Philippines. Uh, Filipinos are known for our hospitality and generosity, and this has reflected on the country's earlier acceptance of people who are leaving their country because of fear of persecution or because of an ongoing conflict. There are several instances in the history of the Philippines that it opened its doors to people who were seeking refuge. Through these experiences, the Philippine government had taken steps to ensure that refugees are given refuge and will be protected. So the first wave was um, the Russian refugees in 1923. Um, They've been to several uh, countries in Asia, but they were not given a safe passage. And the Philippines opened its doors and accepted the Russians seeking a safe passage. While others, um, there are two groups and others um, left to Manchuria and then the, the others remained here in the Philippines. The second wave was the Jewish refugees from 1934 to 1940. Um, the refugees admitted to the Philippines um, were from Europe, escaping the Nazi persecution during the World War II. So during this time, President Manuel L. Quezon called on all Filipinos to welcome refugees and instructed government agencies to provide the necessary assistance. The third wave was the Spanish Republicans. And this was related to the civil war that happened in, I think, around 1939. So they were welcome and they, because they experienced difficulties in obtaining visas from other countries. And among the countries that grad, who did grant them visas were former um, colonies of Spain, Mexico, and then you have the Dominican Republic and the Philippines. And then the fourth wave was about the Chinese refugees from the main, from mainland China, who fled their country because of who fled their country because of the um, the civil war uh, during 1940s. So around 30,000 Chinese who are members of Kuomintang were welcome in the Philippines. And then during this time, the Philippine Congress enacted the Philippine Immigration Act of 1940, which limits the annual quota for immigrants, but at the same time give or gave powers to the president to admit refugees seeking refuge to the country. The fifth wave was about the white Russians. This is the second um, wave of Russians Uh, Russian refugees who came to the Philippines. Um, The first one was set or the first one set the precedent for the amendment of the Displaced Persons Act of 1948. And so the Philippines was the only country who expressed willingness to accept refugees, even when the country was still reeling from the devastation of World War II. Um, The sixth wave are the Vietnamese boat people. Um, These are the Vietnamese who are fleeing the Vietnam War and an eventual reunification of Vietnam. So their boats were washed up in the northern part of the Philippines and around 2,700 refugees were admitted and lived in refugee processing centers in Palawan. The seventh wave was during the 1970s and this is Uh, the Iranians who were studying and working here in Manila. And during the Iranian revolution, they sought um, refugee status in the Philippines out of the fear of persecution. The eighth wave was the Indo-Chinese because during 1980s, uh, the countries like Lao PDR, Cambodia, and Vietnam are still um, experiencing Um, instability. So during this time, the Philippine government opened the the Philippine Refugee Processing Center in Bataan. The ninth wave was the East Timorese who were given temporary protection during the country's struggle for independence from 
um, Indonesia. So the refugees from Timor Leste were repatriated back to the country after a peaceful transition um, restored the security in the country. So um, lately, there's also a pronouncement coming from the president, President Duterte, that they that the Philippines will open its doors um, to the Rohingyans who are fleeing um, the conflict in Myanmar. However, um, I think there's there are no um, data as of yet whether um, Rohingyans actually came here uh, to seek refuge in the Philippines. But as of 2018, the Philippines is home to 6, 000, uh, 642 refugees and 248 as asylum seekers. Um, large populations are from Syria and Pakistan and Iran. The data came from um, the UNHCR. When I did an interview with the Department of Justice, I um, they requested me to actually um, send them formal requests to get all the entire data um, for uh, the number of refugees. Uh, let's look at the refugee experiences of Republic of Korea. So they also acceded the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees and 1967 protocol. And they also acceded to the 1954 convention relating to the status of stateless person. From 1994 to um, 31st of October 2016, there are a total of 21,291 asylum claims and had been lodged in Korea. And out of these, only 616 persons were recognized as refugees and 1,000 nine persons were granted humanitarian status. Um, humanitarian status, as I will explain later, is like a, like a temporary status for those who are, who are seeking um, reconsideration for their applications. So because uh, uh, Korea is or acceded to the 1951 convention, which actually um, has a provision related to non-refoulement, you cannot bring back um, the refugees to their um, or to their country of origin. So instead, they gave them humanitarian status. So the number of applications has risen from approximately 1,000 applications in 2012 to more than 7,500 applications in 2016. And the Korean authorities have significantly increased resources and staff dedicated to refugee status determination. Um, the refugee status determination is under the Ministry of Justice. And then in 2017, they had this um, refugee resettlement project. Um, and for the first time in history, the Republic of Korea welcomed its group of 22 refugees from Myanmar for settlement. And the four families who have been living in a Thai refugee camp had been accepted as part of a pilot refugee resettlement project. Just to give you a um, background on how many um, refugee applications and uh, the actual number of refugees in Korea, I got this from Nansen. And the data came from the Ministry of Justice, Department of Refugee Affairs. So as you can see, there are 15,452 refugee applications, and then 79 people received refugee status recognition in 2019. And then the rate of refugee recognition in 2019 was 0.4%. Um, this is actually... Um, for Korea, this is a bit, um, you know, um, sensitive issue because uh, amongst the members of the OECD countries, they're also, I mean, they have one of the lowest acceptance rate of refugees. So let's look at um, policy responses of the two countries. Um, 
So the two countries, as I mentioned, are parties to the 1951 Convention and the 1967 Protocol um, for Refugees. But when it comes to policies related to the admission and protection of refugees, um, the Republic of Korea, uh, instead of using the immigration law, they created the Refugee Act of 2012. Okay. Um, so compared to the Philippines, uh, right now, the Philippines doesn't have a Refugee Act or a Refugee Law. Um, the Department of Justice is actually using as a basis circular number 58, um, establishing the refugee and stateless status and determination procedure for those who are seeking um, refugee status in the Philippines. They're also um, using the Philippine Immigration Act of 1940. Actually, there are other um, laws related to you know, the protection of refugees, um, but um, these are from the different departments um, here in the Philippines. So defined asylum seekers as refugees um, based on the uh, based on the refugee act of the of korea um, there's no specific definition um, but there is a provision that says a person who applied for refugee status refers to an alien who has filed a refugee status application because um, asylum seekers are um, yet to be considered as refugees. Uh, in the case of the Philippines, um, we, we don't have an exact definition of asylum seekers. If you look at the circular 58 of the Department of Justice, um, they only provide the definition of what uh, constitutes a refugee. And then you have the policy as a non-refoulement clause or the policy has a non repalment clause. Uh, so our, the Co Refugee Act of Korea um, has a non repalment clause, and it's uh, found in Article 3, Prohibition of Refoulement. In the case of the Philippines, there's no uh, non repalment clause, but there is a specific provision that says um, if in case the application of the refugee uh, becomes or if the applic application was not approved, uh, then the refugee will be given enough time to actually look for um, other countries where they can have refuge. Uh, created government agencies responsible for the treatment of refugees. Uh, in the case of Korea, there's Article 25, the Establishment and or Organization of the Refugee Committee, which is under the um, auspices of the Ministry of Justice. In the case of the Philippines, um, there is the Refugees and Stateless Persons Protection Unit, also under the Department of Justice. Um, also, I'd like to note that um, there is an interagency agreement on the protection of asylum seekers, refugees, and stateless persons in the Philippines. Um, this consists of um, Department of Justice, Department of Labor and Employment, uh, Professional Regulations Commission, Department of Social Welfare and Development. Um, next one is, uh, is there like an established procedure for the determination of refugee status? There is a procedure for both um, Republic of Korea and also the Philippines. Let's look at the granting of admission and treatment of refugees. So in terms of admission and treatment of refugees, the Republic of Korea um, outlined it in Section 1, Treatment and Recognition of Refugees, and Article 30, uh, Treatment of Recognized Refugees. And there are, they actually provided several um, um, benefits for those who will be granted um, a refugee status. 
Uh, while in the Philippines, there's Section 15, Effects of Recognition of Circular Number uh, 58. Okay. Um, admission of asylum seekers at the port of entry, both countries um, are allowing admission of asylum seekers in port of entry. Okay. So the next one is providing rights and restrictions on refugees. There's, there are several um, provisions under the Republic of Korea Act, uh, Refugee Act. There's Article 30, Article 31, Provisions for Social Security, Article 32, Basic Livelihood Security, Article 33, Guarantee of Education, Article 34, Social Integration Program. Uh, in the case of the Philippines, there's Section 15, Effects of Recognition of Circular Number 58. But there is no specific, um, you know, specific um, mention of the different um, benefits or rights that can be enjoyed by um, the refugees. Although um, I did some further research, I, I think the, the refugees um, in the Philippines also enjoy um, basic li uh, livelihood security they're allowed to search for jobs they're given um they're also allowed to like choose a location where they want to be integrated so in terms of providing assistance to long-term refugees um i think it's the same with the one that i mentioned previously but in the case of the philippines there's no specific provision i think one of the reasons why these happen it's because um, of course the limited resources and capacity of the philippine government to um, provide all these um, assistance to refugees but um, the government is also according to the department of justice um, they're also closely coordinating with the unhcr and other um, NGOs for the um, for assisting um, refugees. Okay, as I mentioned, um, there are established cooperation between UNHCR and also um, I different um, INGOs and IGOs for both the Philippines and also Korea. Um, Karen Jacobson uh, provided ex some um, explanation about the factors uh, influencing refugee policy choices of countries. Um, this is situated in like developing countries. And number one would be bureaucratic influence. Um, are there um, governmental institutions just trying to push for um, a more improved policy coming from the government. And then the second one is international relations. Um, just like what I mentioned in the case of South Korea, um, there seem to be a kind of um, pressure to perform better in terms of accepting refugees um, because of the current status of the country. Um, they are also somehow looking at their commitment um, to the international refugee regimes. Okay. Um, other factors include local absorption capacity. Um, how many refugees can you basically um, accept given your um, resources or limited resources or econ economic capability, so on and so forth. And the last one was the national security. Um, will it be beneficial if you accept refugees or will it threaten the security of the community? So in the case of the Philippines, um, I think when you, when you talk about factors influencing policy choices, um, there are histori historical experiences, our long history of accepting refugees had somehow normalized the idea that we have to accept refugees and that we have to consider them as part of our community. In terms of international regime, 
Um, we also wanted to affirm our commitment to these international regimes despite um, the limited resources that we have, our capacity. And then also local absorption capacity means um, you know, the multicultural society of the Philippines um, somehow created an impact on the integration of refugees in our society. In the case of South Korea, um, I think one of the factors are like in, is international relations, Korea's role as a middle power, um, and also South Korea wanting to project a good image in the international community. As I mentioned, um, in the OECD, among OECD countries, South Korea is one of the um, uh, lowest in terms of refugee acceptance. And so they wanted to perform better in that specific area. And then the last one would be, of course, it, South Korea wanted to affirm its commitment to the international um, refugee regimes that it has succeeded um, in the past. What are the challenges? So in the case of the Philippines, I think the challenge is the consolidation of law and policy. Uh, perhaps a passage of a refugee law would be able to help in consolidating laws and policies. But um, I was actually thinking it also can be a, an advantage of not having one because uh, it might have a repercussion, like people might react to, um, and we might not be able to accept more refugees in the future because of that kind of situation. And later on, I'm going to explain why in the case of South Korea. Next one is enhanced bureaucratic process, um, streamlining procedures for application and approval, and further enhanced coordination of agencies. There, there's an interagency cooperation when you talk about refugee protection in the Philippines. But I hope that um, they would further enhance their coordination in order to develop more programs appropriate for um, refugees. And last one is economic consideration in helping refugees, uh, providing social assistance to refugees and their family. I think that's something that the government should also work on. In the case of South Korea, um, the challenges are, of course, um, the external pressure. As an industrialized country, Korea is facing uh, a mounting pressure to play a bigger role in the refugee problem. Um, there's also a need to address the gaps in the refugee law. Uh, there are um, instances uh, of refugees not being accepted um, because of some specific reasons, you know. So, yeah, there's a need to address that gap. Um, also, challenge would, another challenge would be social integration of refugees. Um, refugees are having difficulties in terms of integrating in the society, although the South Korean government has a lot of programs um, for refugee integration. So they offer um, Korean language courses um, and other um, capacity building programs in order to assist the, uh, the refugees. The last one would be social backlash. I think South Korea should be able to address the issue of refugees being a threat to the security of the community. Um, there's a debate between when the Yemeni um, refugees or asylum seekers arrived in Jeju back in 2018. There's a social backlash because, um, and then they criticized the government for allowing these, um, um, for allowing these uh, asylum seekers to be in Jeju Island. And, um, the point of their, the, the contention of those who are criticizing the government is the idea that you don't know exactly who are the, who are the real refugees to a fake refugee. 
and that is something that should uh, the government should be able to address. So as for my tentative conclusion, um, two countries succeeded to various refugee regimes and affirm its commitment to assist refugees who are fleeing countries, other countries. The two governments' policies, policy responses presents advantages and disadvantages. Um, Korea's enactment of refugee law consolidated all existing laws and streamlined all government efforts related to the protection of refugees. The absence of Philippine refugee law might be viewed as a negative response. However, the country, the current policies are strategic given the economic and local capacity of the country to accept refugees. The major factors influencing current policies of the Philippines is its historical experience, its commitment to international refugee regimes, and its local capacity absorption. On the other hand, Korea's major factors influencing policy response are the pressure from the international community to accept more refugees, as well as its commitment to various international refugee regimes. And that's all for my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Isa, for your very insightful lectures. We already have questions for you here, but while we consolidate our questions for uh, both Dr. Jong and Professor Isla, let me introduce to you our first discussant for this afternoon who would provide input uh, to Dr. Jong's lecture. So everyone, our first discussant for this afternoon is Dr. Andrew Yaw, a professor of politics and director of Asian Studies at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Dr. Yaw, the floor is now yours. Thank you for reminding me for the unmute. So now that I'm unmuted, I just want to thank uh, the organizers, uh, UP Dillman Korean uh, Research Center, and uh, for inviting me to the third uh, Congress of Korean Studies uh, here in the Philippines. And even though my institution's in uh, Washington, D.C., I'm very close to all of you here in uh, Manila. Um, I, so my, I understand my comments for primarily for uh, Dr. Zhang. I do have some comments for Dr. Yu as well too, but uh, maybe I can wait during the Q&A since I don't want to steal Dr. Franco's thunder. Um, so I'll, I'll hold off on those. Uh, but for, for Dr. Zhang, I mean, this was a really interesting presentation. I think for those who aren't as familiar with uh, inter-Korea dynamics between North and South, I think it might be instructive. If your understanding of uh, North-South dynamics comes primarily from crash landing on you, uh, then you might have a, uh, a misconception of the way North, uh, South Koreans perceive North Korea. Um, and uh, it, it is, uh, I mean, I think Dr. Jung pointed this out quite well, but there are a lot of hardships that North Korean defectors face once they come to South Korea. Um, they, they're, they've gone through tremendous trauma, of course, in their journeys. Uh, in their journey coming from uh, North Korea uh, by way of China to South Korea. And as Dr. Jung highlighted, there may have been abuse along the way in China. Maybe I wasn't uh, quite, as, quite as aware of this, but even abuse within uh, centers in, in South Korea with the NIS during the interrogation process. And as Dr. Jung also mentioned, there are a lot of women that may be abused 80% uh, of North Korean defectors are women. And so that's also an interesting statistic to keep in mind. Um, but once they uh, come to South Korea, even though they face trauma, they uh, then face discrimination. Um, and that might be somewhat puzzling as well too, because you think of Koreans and there is this euphoria or this vision of having a one Korea. And I think that still exists, but it's more of an ideal in, in practice or in reality. Um, you know, there, there's uh, North Korean defectors do face discrimination and it could be for economic reasons, competition for jobs, or it could just be um, uh, discrimination. I don't want to say racism um, uh, because they're both ethnically Korean, but there is this uh, form of discrimination that exists. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's great that Dr. Jung can 
just illuminate on some of the hardships faced by uh, North Korean uh, defectors in South Korea. I do want to uh, just delve a little bit further into his theoretical argument, or I don't know if it's a theory, but his explanation for why uh, some of these uh, difficulties, uh, why some of, why North Korean defectors face these difficulties once they come to South Korea, and he he sets up this uh, uh, dichotomy between uh, you know, refugees, which uh, seek uh, political acceptance. So. Uh, uh, so are, are they are they refugees? Are they seeking political asylum, or are these economic migrants? And you know, that's often a debate, even among, uh, I guess, in China. I think that's where it's really. I think the UN and the US have really pushed the Chinese to uh, ref to treat North Koreans as refugees, not just as economic migrants. But of course, in South Korea as well too, they're seen uh, as economic migrants and. Uh, for this reason, that's why they're not uh, gained. It, it's harder for North Koreans to gain acceptance, that they aren't as integrated as well. There aren't as many uh, perhaps social programs that there should be that can help uh, North Koreans assimilate into South Korean society. So that's the, one of the explanations, or the, the primary explanation that he offered. Um, but I wanted to offer a different uh, argument, one that's based more on, on race and identity and the way that South Koreans look at citizenship. And some of this work has been done by uh, you know, a colleague, a friend of mine at the University of Missouri, Aram, uh, Aram Her. So she's looked at uh, citizenship, North Korean citizenship, um, or citizenship in South Korea and how, how that's viewed by North Koreans. And so in, in this alternative explanation that I might offer, on one hand, South Koreans think about citizenship based on citizenship or South Korean identity. Um, based on uh, ethnicity. Um, so I, I guess before we get to citizenship, it's, it's about how you view uh, national identity. And so there is an argument about Koreans being eth uh, uh, ethnically homogenous. And again, it goes back to this ideal of a one Korea, a pure bloodline. Um, so we see these arguments quite often, but then there's a, a, a counter argument out there that's, well, citizenship or identity in South Korea is changing. It's not so much based on ethnicity uh, it's not ethnic identity, something that's fixed, but it's really one based on uh, cosmopolitanism or this I idea of, of a civic, uh, a civically defined uh, uh, a version of citizenship where it's not based on you know, identity, but it's more about creed and do you hold to the values of you know, democracy and you know, South, what, what identifies South Korea today? Is it it's, it's a democratic values, it's about cosmopolitanism. And so these are the things that are defining uh, what it means to be South Korea. And so if you look at those, uh, and of course there's, there's some overlap, but if you look at those two, I guess, differences between uh, the two different understandings of citizenship or identity, and then put in the North Korea picture, uh, if, you're, if you hold citizenship based on ethnicity or identity, this oneness or pure bloodline, then you would assume they would be easy for North Koreans to integrate because they look Korean, they speak Korean, even if they have an accent. And so they should be embraced by South Koreans, but that's not the case. And so in some ways that may uh, give uh, more weight to this idea that perhaps South Korean, uh, South Korean understanding of national identity or citizenship has evolved so that it's one based on these cosmopolitan values or democratic values. And that's something that's very difficult for, I think, North Koreans to perhaps embrace uh, or learn. And because of there's that awkward fit, you know, you can imagine a, a North Korean who's been socialized into uh, a, an authoritarian or a totalitarian society suddenly now living in a democracy. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be quite, quite difficult. And then, of course, when you think about uh, South Koreans as well, too, if you go back to race and uh, identity, you know, yes, North Koreans are the same, you know, Korean people, but uh, I mean, unfortunately, uh, even South Koreans, there, there's a pecking order in terms of which sort of Koreans are preferred. So if you're a Korean American or a Korean Canadian, it's based on economics. I think they're more willing to accept a Korean American as Korean. But then if you look at the treatment of Korean Chinese, the Hwagyo, for instance, you know, they're, uh, you know, they make downright racist remarks. They're still Koreans. And so there is this pecking order. And if you go below the Korean Chinese, you get the North Korean refugees. And so for these reasons, it makes it very difficult, I think, for 
um, North Koreans to uh, assimilate. So that's just a different way of looking at this difficulty of assimilation and you know explaining why there are these hardships North Koreans face. It's not just about I guess this this definition of whether they're economic migrants or um, you know political asylum seekers or refugees, but we have to get into this discussion about race and identity and multiculturalism. Um, the last point I'll I'll address is it has goes back to this idea of refugees. So I think Dr. Jung um, was suggesting that we should um, we should accept or at least consider North Koreans to be refugees once they're in South Korea. And it is true that if you defect uh, and you get sent back to if if a North Korean returns to North Korea, they're very likely going to be persecuted, harassed, thrown in prison. Um, it's not 100% of the case. These days, North Koreans are trying to use redefectors for their own propaganda. But for the most part, there's going to be some form of punishment. And for that reason, you could uh, you can make a claim or stake that they should North Koreans should receive uh, uh, asylum or refugee status. But I would just ask, you know, if, if I could problem problematize that argument a bit further. Um, you know, it's a question of whether this is an a, is this a blanket category then? So any North Korean defector that comes to South Korea should they become a refugee? I think about some of the elite defectors that come. So the Taeyong Ho or the um, the recent defector, the acting ambassador, North Korean ambassador to Italy, you know, defected um, earlier this year, and it was just, I mean, it, the news just broke out a few weeks ago. But in those cases, should those individuals be treated as? Um, treated as refugees, because were they persecuted in North Korea? And I think the problem is it's after the fact, after you defect, you face persecution. Yes, there's human rights violations in North Korea, but for the most part, these North Koreans that are leaving, do they face this sorts of situation? You know, do they face political violence? And um, are they are they displaced? You know, what's are, are they being persecuted? And, and that's it's not really quite clear. It's because it's after the fact, after the defect, that's when might face persecution, why there might be a claim for refugee status. But it goes back to the question of our, whether a blanket you know, policy should be made for treating all North Koreans as, as refugees. And I think that's something that the North, or excuse me, the South Korean government doesn't want to do, just given the number of, of refugees, uh, or excuse me, the number of North Korean defectors that are in South Korea today. I think it's like 32, 32, 33,000, something around on that ballpark. And if, even though the numbers are decreasing in terms of uh, defectors uh, crossing into South Korea, it's, um, if you think about the economics of it uh, and, and what the South Koreans would have to give, they, it's, it could be considerably more than just uh, what they're currently providing for North Korean uh, defectors. So I'll stop there. And in the Q&A, hopefully I have time to maybe uh, ask some or make some comments or questions for uh, Dr. Yusuf's paper. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayer. Actually, we already have questions for you here, but yeah, let's uh, wait for our open forum session. And I'll, I'm also sure that Dr. John cannot wait to respond to your discussion, but uh, I'll also put that on hold. Okay, at this point, I would like to call on our second discussion. Our next discussion is an associate professor from the Department of Political Science of the University of the Philippines, Lemon. Everyone, our discussant, Dr. Jean and Tina's Frankel. Dr. Frankel, whenever you're ready. Hi, everyone. Um, I just have very brief comments on both uh, presentations. Uh, for Professor Isla, it, yeah, yes, I agree that uh, historically the Philippines has been uh, very much involved with uh, uh, um, accepting refugees, and that's something that uh, I think uh, the government is very much aware of, and that is why um, every time a, a diplomat from any of these countries where uh, ref refugees have come from, we usually, the Philippine government has used this uh, in, in its diplomatic um, uh, pronouncements every time uh, there are issues like this, or uh, there are visits, or the Philippine president visit this this country. Um, indeed, uh, in Korea, of course, it's a different situation. It it does it, it is still a very sensitive issue, but that does not mean also that the Philippines are any less. Uh, uh, we're not actually. Um, 
racist because um, um, I mean I, I take it from the study of uh, Dr. Jason Cabanes of De La Salle University. I, I don't know if you read, read about his uh, um, paper that says that uh, the Philippines actually has um, 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 a hierarchy of uh, discriminatory attitudes, meaning to say that we're okay with, uh, well, we're not talking about refugees, but I think it's similar um, if uh, we're uh, looking at foreigners who have dark skin, dark skins, we, we're, we're more um, discriminating against them compared to, for instance, to, to, to white people. Um, and that even um, even uh, um, the Chinese, for instance, uh, we're still very much uh, um, we, we're still very much uh, uh, very um, uh, discriminating against uh, the Chinese here in the Philippines, as you can see with with this uh, coronavirus issue, with a uh, uh, proliferation of. Uh, uh, these uh, gambling, online gambling operations. Um, but um, the, our, uh, what you call this, our experience with, uh, especially our recent experiences with, uh, with refugees do not just have anything to do with uh, our history. It also has something to do, especially the more recent ones with our experience as a migrant sending state. We've always been regarded as a migrant sending state, but um, we've uh, also accepted quite a number of uh, immigrants. And, um, and that's also something that we want to develop. But then um, you said something about our refugee situation or our ref refugee policies being quite underdeveloped compared to Korea. Uh, and you said that it's, it's uh, good, no, in a sense, but then, so there's no rigidity uh, in, in the policy, but then, uh, uh, or in the practices, in the absence of a policy, but then you can also look at it from the point of view of our uh, immigration policy. It, we have really not developed it. We've really been very much uh, what you call this um, vigilant in reforming or uh, um, what you call this formulating policies or programs or uh, establishing agencies that would enhance our uh, immigration policy because it's within the interest of the state. No, uh, we get so much from the remittances of our uh, migrants abroad. That's one thing. With regard to statelessness, of course, not uh, some stateless persons are also refugees, but not all refugees are stateless. You also mentioned it. Um, yeah, we also have uh, an interest there, no? Because there are also a lot of Filipino stateless, especially those uh, uh, children from Saba, uh, those from Southern Mindanao. Uh, from they have uh, Indonesian fathers or mothers, and also those uh, children who are uh, um, children of our um, women migrant workers from uh, the Gulf states. No, they have different uh, um, citizenship laws there, and that's for, and for that reason there are a lot of uh, uh, Filipino stateless children. So we have we sort of have an affinity with with these issues. Um, so yeah, that those those are just my my. Uh, I'm happy to our this, uh, um, talk or this forum is about or is about refugee because um, this is very tiny. Um, we have uh, established the blue contact for safe and order uh, migration, and um, people say that this is going to be move towards an international regime no? uh, for migration governance because to this state, this is something that has not really been very much uh, um, practiced or institutionalized. And for that reason, international relations as a field of discipline has not really, um, uh, what you call this, uh, caught up with uh, in terms of uh, 
um, academic uh, theorizing no? uh, uh, with regard to the topic of international migration. Uh, with regard to Dr. Jung's presentation, thank you for that very informative presentation. And um, yes, I was a bit uh, appalled at the rape and sexual uh, assault committed to uh, women uh, refugees. And what I did was to look at the, the report of the um, committee on the um, convention on uh, this on all form on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, CIDO, uh, of which uh, it's a treaty on women, of which South Korea is a signatory. And I read that time and again the CIDO committee. Uh, this is the latest 2018 concluding comments, meaning to say this is the critique of the of that particular committee on the report of South Korea, of the South Korean government. They have called on the South Korean government to have anti-discriminatory -discri policies against um, immigrants and also to have some sort of uh, programs for women refugees. And they've also pointed out that um, uh, some quite a number of uh, North Korean refugees or defectors as the report uh, said have been subjected to prostitution. So that's quite alarming. And um, it, among scholars of feminist international relations, this is something that they study. And the way they explain it is that um, this is the best way for uh, soldiers to feminize the quote unquote the other because um, if you rape or if you sexually assault the women of the quote unquote enemy, then you are actually feminizing the men of the enemy because the men could not, cannot protect them. So that's, that's one way also of looking at it. Maybe you can look at the literature on, on that, no? Um, what else? Um, yeah, you mentioned about so you mentioned about the the reports by the women, uh, your national women's machinery, no, the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family, and I, I um, I'm happy that um, your national women's machinery is very much uh, proactive, no, in terms of looking at the situation of your uh, women refugees. But uh, what I'm uh, thinking is that probably uh, policy-wise, your uh, MOGEF, MOGEF as M O G E F, might not be as uh, what you call this. They, um, among the ministries, they might as just like here in the Philippines, they might not be as powerful compared, of course, to the other ministries that handle uh, these uh, these defectors. So, uh, but then the mere fact that they report it. Uh, also, uh, I mean, means a lot, no? And um, I think uh, they are also uh, very much uh, aware of the, um, the commitment of the South Korean government to the SIDO. So yeah, um, uh, those are just my comments and uh, I'll be happy also to join the Q&A later. So thank you so much for your presentations. Thank you so much, Dr. Franco. We also appreciate your input on our lectures for this afternoon. I would like to give, as part of our open forum, I would like to give uh, an opportunity uh, to Dr. Zhang to briefly comment on Dr. Yeo's discussion. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, uh, Dr. Zhang. Um, I, I couldn't catch the, the last question. So am I supposed to, uh, what am I supposed to do here? I couldn't. Oh, uh, would you like to take this opportunity, uh, Dr. Ya, to give your question to Dr. Zhang? Yeah, uh, um, yes, sure. Um, The question regarding uh, about whether to give uh, the legal status, I mean, to 
the all refugees. Um, I think I start a, a good question here. So my intention was to start this debate in academic as well as uh, in public so that the, the more people are aware of the situation. Um, but he's quite right. I agree with uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Yao's uh, comment that uh, we have to differentiate between whether to give the Korean national citizenship to upon, I mean, to the all North Korean defectors upon their arrival, or should we be selective? That I think is a great debate and it can be a great paper and a great study for the future. But uh, honestly, I did not really think about that issue, to be honest. But it's really, I'm grateful for Dr. Yao to point that out. Uh, but about, the, about what he mentioned about high profile uh, defectors like such as uh, Tae Young Ho and some other name which I could not really uh, get, but Tae Young Ho, um, my argument is based on the reports of the BBC, I mean, not the BBC, but uh, uh, the media in uh, the United Kingdom where he was, uh, uh, apparently a, I don't know, assistant uh, deputy uh, uh, ambassador. Uh, he served as a deputy ambassador and then um, uh, defected to South Korea. But he actually is facing charges of a child rape as well as uh, some forgeries. So he, in fact, when he go back, he goes back to North Korea are actually uh, obliged to go through the legal indictment and maybe perhaps to persecute it. So in fear of that, he might have, uh, I don't know, but he might have defected for those reasons. So we have to be really selective. And yes, there's got to be a more discussion so that we can improve uh, this uh, discussions on whether to give the legal status to all the refugees or should we be selective? So uh, I would uh, live at that moment. At, 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 I, I will leave it at here uh, to answer Dr. Yeo's uh, comment. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang. And now I will give the floor to Professor Ifa if you'd like to respond to Dr. Franklin or Dr. Yeo. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Franco, for the comments about the research. Um, regarding the historically involvement of the Philippines um, in uh, refugee and the idea that Filipinos are racist uh, by nature, um, I was actually thinking about it um, when I mentioned that there might it's might, it might be strategic for the Philippines not to have a refugee law because the creation of such might create social backlash. Like um, while it's being debated in the Congress, um, there might be, you know, um, reaction or negative reaction coming from the people, specifically because um, it involves, you know, um, economic resources of the country being diverted to um, the group, this group of people. So um, I don't, well, uh, I don't want to put it like a racist, um, you know, um, attitude of Filipinos, but more like it's, it's, an, it's a, uh, somehow kind of they, or it might, uh, how to say this, um, it might be kind of, um somehow how do you put it like it's like um when there are issues you know we react to it abruptly and so um i think in that situation if we pushed for let's say um a refugee law then it would somehow create a si similar situation um just like what happened in south korea for example um People are reacting to the um, this, the the passage of the refugee law, and some some reactions were like, 
um, we don't need that. You know, you don't need to um, divert your resources to um, these foreigners, something like that. Um, I was thinking um, there would be similar reaction um, if we we want to have this um, passage of a refugee law. Maybe that's one of the reasons why the the, the government kind of um, did not make this as a priority um, because the idea that um, yeah, there will be repercussions, um, reactions coming from people. And at the same time, also looking at, you know, the, the limited resources that we have. Um, I think because when you, although the advantage of having a refugee law is to basically consolidate everything, right? Um, because right now it's scattered everywhere. Like there are policies for, from Dole, there are policies from uh, development, uh, when, uh, social welfare and development, um, but for as long as the interagency is working together, um, together um, with the with the UNHCR, I think um, they would be able to provide um, meaningful programs for for refugees. Um, in the case of the uh, the, uh, the case of the stateless persons, I I do agree with the idea that there are stateless persons in Sabah. Um, Malaysia, Filipino stateless person, considered as a stateless. There are also um, people who are from, from Indonesia um, that doesn't have the Filipino citizenship. And I think the government and the UNHCR are already working um, to help these people acquire uh, Filipino citizenship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Isla. Now we proceed to our Q&A session. And I believe Dr. Yo earlier has his question reserved for right now. So Dr. Yo, you may now ask your question to, I believe, Professor Isla or to Dr. Zhang. Uh, please uh, feel free to ask that. Sure, unless there are other questions in the queue. I don't, I, if other people, audience members want to ask anything, maybe we can go to those first or do you want me? Oh, go ahead, uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Okay. Yao. Um, I was really struck by Dr. Yusuf's presentation, and it, I'm assuming it's a paper, and it makes for a really interesting paper to look at this comparison between Korea and the Philippines. But I felt like the most important question wasn't really addressed for me. And uh, I mean, there's this, and, and that's this puzzle with South Korea of why are they so stingy when it comes to uh, ref a refugee policy or, re or uh, admitting refugees into into the country and uh, in the end you had you put up a few you, on the slides there are a few variables that you that had suggested what some of those reasonings might be related to bureaucracy maybe economics uh, international relations and um, I mean the first thing that jumped to my mind though was again this question of uh, race and identity. And I feel very odd saying that because I'm not a race and identity scholar. I'm like an international relations, not that race and identity isn't part of international relations, but I usually look at things like uh, international institutions or, you know, state power. But yeah, you know, for me, what kind of jumped out was the idea that, you know, Philippines is more of a multicultural society, whereas Philipp uh, South Korea, South Korea, again, going back to this theme of, you know, uh, one ethnic identity or being a homogenous, um, ethnically homogenous country. I, I don't know if that affects then the public perceptions or views of refugees. I'm sure it does to some extent, but I don't know if that's the answer or not. And I was wondering if you could maybe say more about it. I know it's a bit politically sensitive to attribute um, a difference to something like identity or race or multiculturalism. Yet, I mean, that's the one key difference that I can find between Philippines and South Korea, because South Korea, they, they certainly have the economic capacity and you know, the, the political capacity in terms of governance. We clearly see that there's uh, laws and you know, policy infrastructures in place to address refugee questions. But yet, uh, you know, 0.4 percent, you know, 79 out of 50, 15,500 uh, that doesn't look that good. And I was just wondering if there's an explanation to it. Yeah. Uh, 
why the government of South Korea is so stingy. Uh, I think it has. I mean, there are a lot. There are a lot of factors that needs to be considered. Um, the first thing um, that I found out. Um, there are also forces that are trying to influence the creation of um, the refugee law, right? Um, it's not just really the government that's wanted to. There are also um, civil society um, putting pressure on the government and at the same time criticizing the government um, for having this kind of policy. So I think that would somehow um, somehow contribute to, you know, the... I mean, would be able to provide answer to your question of why the government of South Korea is so stingy about um, the refugee pol uh, refugee acceptance. Um, I think the government of South Korea also recognized that indeed there are a lot of things to do needs that needs to be done when you talk about accepting um, refugees. Um, but then again. Um, uh, I think the domestic politics plays an important role also um, in um, ensuring that these people would be able to be, you know, um, integrated into their society and so on and so forth. Some some groups um, in the Korean society, the, the Korean society are also using this issue in order to hide then, you know, the, you, uh, the uh, I mean to, to antagonize, you know, the the current administration policy um, related to refugees. I think those are some of the things that um, can answer the the question that you posted. And at the same time, there are um, scholars that talks about um, the importance of um, the meaning of refugee in a culture, because, for example, in Carl culture like um, in Islam, you know, um, and in other um, uh, societies, I think they have this more um, subdued concept of refugee. So they wanted to just like welcome people and they know that these people are in need. And so um, there's really a, a factor when you talk about um, cultural meaning of um uh, refugee. I, I think um, Jacobson also mentioned that um, there is a, there's also a factor related to ethnicity. Okay, the idea that um, you know a homogeneous society would be suddenly you know accept uh, people from a different society might also you know have an impact on the overall policy response of the government, but. I wouldn't be so pessimistic about this situation. I know that it's it's really a process. Um, later on, Korea would be able to become fully um, multicultural and they would be able to understand um, that there is, you know, there's really an obligation for, for everyone to accept um, people who are in need of assistance, specifically when you talk about refugees. I know, there are there are also NGOs working um, to protect and also to promote um, refugees in in South Korea, and I think they would be very much helpful in normalizing this uh, kind of situation. Um, but it would take a while um, for us to be able to realize that. I guess. May I also uh, oh. make a go ahead, Dr. Franco. I was just thinking, um, based on Professor Yo's uh, question, I think in the Philippines, it, it is also something to do with, like mm -hmm. Professor Isla said that the, the bill has been parked no? in Congress, meaning it, it's not no longer a priority. I guess even if um, indeed there are still racist attitudes in, in Philippine society, I think the major factor probably why it may not actually um, be politically acceptable on the part of the Philippines is maybe there's something to do with the fact that people might wonder why we are uh, allocating a budget for refugees when in fact 
the Philippine government could not even take care of uh, displaced migrant workers from abroad, specific, specifically as we've seen now uh, with the pandemic. That, that's one. So it's, it may not really be about racist um, attitudes compared because of our or uh, identity issues such as, for instance, uh, on the part of Korea, but it's really more about these things. And for politicians, uh, you know, they really know the symbolic value of migrant workers in the Philippines. So they will, the moment this will be a, a political discourse about that particular bill, then they will not touch that particular uh, proposal. Yeah. With regard to to South Korea, I don't know if you also l looked at it. Are political uh, do political parties in Korea also look at this situation? Do they have debates regarding this, or are these only at the level of society? I don't know. Maybe Professor Yo can respond to this or. I mean, certainly there's more discussion at the civil societal level, especially not just with refugees, but also with like migration policy. But politics, it's so and short answer is no, it's not a major issue. Um, it's not part of a party platform for either the progressive or conservative parties. But the one time it did come up was, you know, at the I think it's during or right before the Olympics. Do you remember there was a bunch of Syrian refugees that ended up on Jeju Island? Um, I think like 400 and, you know, it, it looked really, the optics look really bad because they, they allowed, somehow they, they were allowed, they managed to come to Korea uh, on Jeju Island, but then it's like no one wanted them there. And so they were sending them back. And so it was a, it was a terrible PR. I mean, it was bad for public, public relations for South Korea. So because of that, there was this open debate. And so the progressive party, of course, talked about, um, you know, having a more humane or a humanitarian policy. And they, and even President Moon Jae-in, who talked about refugees during the Korean War, was saying it's now time for us to accept refugees, just as we were once refugees. Um, so politically, he said that, and I think they quietly accepted, uh, I can't remember, like a, a, a few dozen. I, I, I don't quote me on any of the numbers, but I know that he ex they accepted a few, but they sent the majority back. Um, but the Conservative Party, of course, they had questions about security. And I know... Uh, Professor Yisla mentioned that you know some Koreans have to kind of overcome the fear of, of you know refugees creating a security problem, and you know Koreans were saying there's you know we're going to have homegrown terrorists uh, in in South Korea if we let them in. So that rhetoric was kind of used by the conservatives. So there was a debate um, at that time, but for the most part, it's not a major issue um, that comes up. I think more broadly, there are issues about multiculturalism and policy towards. Um, migrants that make their way, but not so much the specific issue of refugees. Right. right. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Yaw and Dr. Fry. Um, now uh, we'll have questions. We'll now entertain questions from our YouTube chat box. We actually have a lot of interesting questions coming in. So we have first from uh, we have first question for Dr. Kuta Yong. Okay. So for Dr. Zhang. Can you elaborate further on the process of assimilation and the discovered weaknesses and problems in the process of, you know, when North Korean refugees come to South Korea? And what was done or being done to address these weaknesses and problems? Hello. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, could you repeat the question again? I couldn't quite can, uh, catch it. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. The question is, can you uh, elaborate further on the process of assimilation? So I think this pertains to the assimilation of North Korean refugees in South Korean society and the discovered weaknesses and problems in this process and what was done or being done to address these weaknesses and problems. Okay. Oh, that's a really good question. It requires about uh, one entire lecture to answer that question. But uh, long story short, uh, my presentation today is specifically to uh, to open up a, a debate to have a better 
uh, rooms for the North Korean defectors to come in and live uh, in the society, in the South Korean society better. The reason why is because without having, uh, you know, the protection, the legal protection, they are actually exposed to a traumatic events. And uh, my, according to my research, which I came across, which I did not really include because it's irrele irrelevant to the topic that I'm talking about, but I've came across a number of um, uh, focus group uh, interviews. Uh, mostly were North Korean defectors uh, who had who had went through the the, the defectors the, the interrogation facility as well as the Hana one, and they have successfully um, uh, transitioned to South Korean society. But about half of the or majority are still actually going through a. Um, uh, traumatic experience because of those one to two years in the solitary confinement. So I think it's really a pressing issue that we should assimilate those and not really assimilate, but to account for those mistakes that we, the South Korea have made in the uh, past and to be a better Korea, we should actually um, stop doing that. And by only also doing that, we have to give them uh, some kind of protection. Not like maybe could maybe the current government is really afraid of giving the entire like uh, citizenship. But maybe there could be a uh, more discussions in terms of like like Dr. Ye had mentioned that we need to start discussing the the the. Um, the magnitude of how we can actually accommodate them better into our society. Because South Korea, as far as I know, are actually having a declining population problem. And uh, our, uh, our, I'm saying our society because it's my country of origin, although I didn't grow up there. Uh, our country faces uh, unpresent, unpresent unprecedented um, situation where the labor force is decreasing rapidly. And, you know, as uh, other participants have mentioned, these refugees and migrants can be a good, a great uh, labor replacement. But as uh, Professor Isla had mentioned, that uh, we're really, and Dr. Yeah, of course, uh, we're really stingy on providing the, 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 the guarantee to the refugees. So that's really we should, something that we should really discuss. And it should be open debate into a public sphere as well as I believe academia. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kutozong. I have a question here for uh, Professor Isla, okay? The, our viewer said that you really have a very interesting topic of presentation and our viewer would like to ask if what were your motivations in comparing uh, these policies of these two countries in terms of refugee acceptance? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my motivations, um, well, these, uh, I mean, Philippines and South Korea are the two democratic countries and both are um, parties to international refugee regimes. However, if you're going to look at the situation, there are um, similarities and differences in their policy responses. Um, that's the primary um, motivation that I, I want to know because, you know, uh, eventually we, the, go the Philippine government might be, you know, um, thinking to further develop or further prioritize um, refugees, you know, in the country as we move forward, um, then we might be able to get, you know, lessons um, in the case of South Korea on how to further strengthen our refugee laws as, as a response to the international refugee regimes. Um, I think there's also a um, question about I mean, the, the first question was hinged to the idea that um, there is 
there are economic migrants in South Korea. Um, I think there's a difference between um, refugees and economic um, actually there's no term economic refugees they are economic migrants because the primary reason um, they went to South Korea is for economic purposes okay um, refugees are fleeing their country because of threats because of violence and the fear of, uh, the fear of persecution so um, I think there's there should be a clear understanding about it uh, it's there are economic migrants, but there are also refugees applying for refugee status in South Korea. All right, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Inkwa. So I think that shed light to this question. Uh, I have here a question for actually for both of you, Professor Isla and Dr. Tong. Okay, so the first, uh, let me go over with the first question How does Korea? Uh, in terms of uh, the 1951 convention and 1967 protocol, how does Korea and the Philippines fare? Okay, that, so that's the first question. There's another question which I will give give it to you after you answer the first one. So it will not be that confusing. Um, in terms of you know the comprehensive um, understanding of the conventions and the protocols, I think um, it was already encapsulated in the Korean refugee law. In the case of the Philippines, um, the, uh, you know, uh, the department circular 58 um, doesn't have the, the, the comprehensive details of um, the protocols. And there are reasons for that. Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned in my um, presentation, there are, we have limited resources and we might not be able to somehow um, cater to the needs if there would be influx of refugees. And so um, there are, I mean, the policies created in the Philippines are there for, se for severance. Um, there's a, you know, but there are rooms for improvement if you're going to ask me. Um, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, Professor Isla. Okay, uh, Dr. Dr. Zhang. Yes, uh, Professor Isla is right, correct, that Korea has uh, actually uh, um, a very detailed um, uh, law specific regarding the UNHCR, but there is a question of a political will, as you know, other discussants, including Dr. Yesla, I mean, Dr. Yo, Ye, and Dr. Isla, and others have mentioned that there's no political will to push it through. No other political party except the Progressive Party are actually interested in. And from a political scientist, uh, no, from not political science, but from a elections point of view, it doesn't catch the vote that much. So that's, I guess, the ultimate the question, uh, the answer that it really doesn't gather vote in Korea. That's a sad reality. But and then maybe we need to educate the publics and the people. Uh, to make them more aware of the refugee situation. All right, I have one question, one very interesting question for Professor Isla. Okay, Professor, what do you think the Philippines would get from helping the Rohingya refugees, especially President Duterte said that he will help them? What we will get? Uh... Yes. Interesting question. Um, well, we would be able to perhaps get good brownies in Southeast Asia because we, <laughs> we, we are the one accepting, uh, you know, refugees from, uh, from Myanmar. Um, but at the same time, I think it's more like um, you know, continuing the tradition of the Philippines and accepting those who are um, in distress um, from other countries. Um, other than that, uh, uh, when you talk about, let's say, economic benefits, um, 
we cannot really somehow say it right now because we don't know exactly if those people coming from um, the Rohingyas or the, uh, from the, uh, the Myanmar are in fact um, skilled workers, you know, that would be able to um, be productive in the society. Right now, I think um, I still don't have a data related to how many Rohingyans are here in the Philippines, you know, because of, um, well, it was just a pronouncement coming from the president that they are welcome. You know, it's for, you know, for perhaps um, diplomatic uh, purposes, I think. Okay, I have... I have a question here that also interests me for Professor Isla. Okay, so it says that based on the data that you have obtained, do we have North Korean refugees in the Philippines? And how does the Philippine government deal with them? Um, one of the commitment of the Philippines or the Philippine government to the international community is to become like a, um, a safe uh, kind of transit for people who are seeking asylum or refugees to other countries. So I think um, in the case of North Koreans, there are, uh, there was, an, there was a, one instance where like 25 North Koreans arrived here in the Philippines, but they did not stay longer because they, they, immediately went back to, I mean, they immediately went to South Korea. Um, this, so it's more like a transit, you know. Um, I think if we're going to accept um, North Korean refugees, there would be repercussions on our diplomatic relations with North Korea. Okay, so do, does that mean that we don't have uh, North Korean refugees staying right now in the Philippines? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that if there are um, North Korean refugees. What I know is that there are, there used to be, but it's just like for transit, you know. Um, they just arrived here for whatever processing and then they went to another country. All right, so I have one here for Dr. Yo. Okay. Dr. Yo, can you describe the gap between what Western media and commentaries say and what is actually happening on the ground in the North Korean Peninsula as far as North Koreans are concerned? What's in the meat? So let me just- Yes, Dr. The question. So I know it sounds like a beauty passion question, but yes, it's directed to- you. But, the but the difference between um, what's uh, portrayed in the media about North Korea and then what's happening on North Korea on the grounds. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Is that the question? I mean, it depends on what media source you look at. There's some that do fairly good reporting. I mean, I'm from based in the US, so a lot of my sources are things like New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal. But then uh, there's very specialized news on North Korea, like NK News um, or uh, NK Daily, which is produced by North Korean defectors on news from the context in North Korea. And so it, if you look at credible sources, I mean, I think it, they uh, sometimes it's guesswork, but I, I think it's fairly credible. I think where you get some of these sensationalized stories um, is from a, the more popular media. Um, I remember like ABC or CNN, you know, they broke the story about Kim Jong Un, like no one's seen him, and it's been like two or three weeks, and everyone was just guessing if he was um, if he had died or not. So it's really hard uh, to guess that reality. But these days, I think the reporting as um, I think North, I think journalists are much more. They've been more careful than they have in the past um, with, with things like sourcing because they know the rumor mills and how these things can spread. But uh, if I step away from issues like refugees or you know what's happening economically on the ground, I mean, I, I still think news will have to sell. So they they want to focus on. Um, you know, I think the most recent thing was the North Korean military parade, like the 70th anniversary, 75th anniversary of the Korean Workers Party, and then they had a big military parade, and everyone gravitated towards the new weapons that North Koreans have. And so it makes it sound like, oh, well, North Korea is ramping up fear, or they're going to launch, they, you know, are they going to do another missile test? 
Um, but the reality is they haven't conducted any nuclear, they haven't any conducted any nuclear tests or mm -hmm. military or missile tests for uh, several months uh, for that fact. Uh, uh, so if you, if you look at the reality, you know, so the media tends to slant or uh, portray North Korea in a way that will, you know, uh, allow, you know, people, viewers to click or to look at the media. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if, if you, you know, look on balance of what's happening on the ground, sometimes there is that gap. So um, I think journalists, media have done a better job, but uh, there is a tendency more to, I think, sensationalize. But if you look at a variety of media sources, I think you can get a clearer picture of what's actually happening on the grounds. All right, so thank you so much, Dr. Yeo. Okay, so I think that's uh, the in the interest of time. I think that is the end of our open forum for this afternoon. Okay, so at this point, I would like to say thank you to our distinguished speakers. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuchel Jong. Thank you, Professor Mark Isla, to our discussants. Dr. Andrew Yaw and Dr. Jean and Venus Franco. Thank you very much for your time, for joining us this afternoon. And of course, thank you to our YouTube viewers who are with us this afternoon. And we are hoping that we'll see you again next Friday. That is October 23rd, and that's going to be the last leg of the third Philippine Korean East Congress, featuring two lectures. One is by Dr. Fernando Paragas of College of Mass Communication of the University of the Philippines, Philippines with his lecture entitled, The Man in the North, The People in the South, The Two Koreas in Philippine News Online, and another lecture from uh, Professor Michelle Correa okay, of Communication Department of the Ateneo de Manila University with her lecture entitled, Korean Drama, Crash Landing on You and the Representation of Inter-Korean Relations. Of course, UPKRC would also like to invite everyone to a public lecture on October 30th at 4.30 p.m. by Professor Mark Chavez of the Department of Linguistic of Linguistics of the University of the Philippines, Philippines. And this lecture would be on waiting the current of time, Hangul, the writing system of Korea. And of course, for more information and updates, okay, please visit www.facebook.com slash UPKRC and don't forget to use hashtag UPKRC and hashtag 3PKC when posting in social networking sites of UPKRC. This is the end of our session for today. See you next Friday. Magandang hapon po. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aldrin, Dr. Thank Jean. you so much, everyone. Thank you very and much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's have a photo Art. session with everybody. Please don't leave now. <laughs> <laughs> okay po. Can you kindly turn on your cameras po? Um, There's Pam. Um, Hello, yeah, Professor. <laughs> so now, okay, one, two, three. Thank you very much, Paul, professors. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you so Thank much, you. professor, Thank for you. your time. So much. It was great talking to you all. Thank, Thank you. you, Maggie. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much.